Mr. Chair, for the purpose of leading the evidence of Ms. McLeod, we will be working and referring only on one bundle. It's, we have taken the liberty of marking it Exhibit P1. It's in the blue folder next to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. Uh, we have marked so it. Uh, so the letter from the Director General is marked P1A. Yes, and is that the, how it's supposed to be. And the num and the numbering continues, Mr. Chair, up until P1G. That will be the last page of the bundle before you. P1A is a letter from the DG, and then after that, P1B is a certain document uh, that, uh, uh, and then P1C, and then P1D is written at the top, annexure supporting information, but seems to be it's a, part of the a report. continuation of the document. Yes. Uh, is, that, is that Even the, the graphs that follow from P1E. P1E. P1G. Yes. Is that, but where does the report start? Does it start it starts where at it P says background? At P1B, yes, Mr. Chair. doesn't start in the usual way that uh, I'm used to, but okay, all right. P, so P1A is the letter from the DG to the commission. P1B up to the end is the report on which the witness will be testifying. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, can I have the spelling of spelling of the same name? Sure. Um, because I don't see it here. Sure. It's um, uh, M A C. M A C. C. Capital or not capital? L E O D. Is is C capital or not capital? Uh, no, the L is oh. capital. M A C. Capital L. Yeah. E O D. E O D. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, you may proceed, Mr. McQuinn. Mr. Chair, the evidence of Ms. McLeod will be corroborating the evidence of Mr. Mohojani. You would recall, Mr. Chair, that Mr. Mohojani, uh, the DG of Treasury, did give evidence before the chair, and there was certain information that was requested to compile for the commission. Yes. And Ms. McLeod is here to do exactly that. Okay. Her evidence does not implicate anyone. Yeah. He will be simply quantifying the economic ramifications of what we have now come to know as the Nene Gate. Ms. Okay. McLeod, on the 23rd of November 2018, Mr. Dondo Mukhajani, the Director General of Treasury, testified before this commission. Are you aware? Yes. Yes. And at the conclusion of his testimony, the chair gave him some homework to do. He was requested to provide information pertaining to the impact of the, what we now known as the Nene Gate to the SA economy. Do you recall? Um, That's yes. what it is, yes. Would I be correct that your evidence today will be corroborating that evidence, and you, you are the person that has been nominated by Treasury to, to provide that quantification of the impact of the Nenegate. Um, I will be corroborating the impact of Nenegate on national debt. Yes. <clears throat> now, where are you currently employed? At the National Treasury. 
And then in what capacity? I'm the chief director for macroeconomic policy. And then in that capacity, what are your responsibilities and functions? Um, I'm responsible for providing um, policy advice to the minister and DG in matters relating to macroeconomic policy. So um, that's got to do with um, monetary policy, savings and investment. Um, we discuss a lot about what the financial market impact are on South Africa's overall vulnerabilities and what policies we should be undertaking to try and manage those. Um, and then we're also responsible for labor market policy advice to the minister. Yes. When did you join National Treasury? In 2010. In 2010. Now, from 2010, can you simply briefly just sketch for us your employment history within the department itself? Sure. Um, I was the director for uh, demand analysis. Well, maybe before you do that, sure. what are your qualifications? Um, I hold a master's in economics from um, Pompeo Fabra. Uh, it's a university in Barcelona, Spain. Um, I have my honors in economics from the University of Stellenbosch, and I completed my Bachelor of Economics at the University of Stellenbosch. Okay, thank you. That was going to be my next question, <laughs> Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Metlod. But uh, can you then go back to the initial question just to contextualize your, 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 your answers? in relation to your employment history? Sure. Um, so I joined Treasury in uh, 2010 as the Director for Demand Analysis. Um, this position is responsible primarily for the monetary policy framework and what can be done to raise savings and investment in the country. Um, there, um, I did a lot of work on inflation targeting, um, on Again, a lot of the work that we do is around what happens to financial markets um, and what the implications are for the fiscus and our macro policy framework, um, and uh, working a lot with the Reserve Bank on issues relating uh, to vulnerabilities mm. um, in South Africa's growth path. If you may be slowly, you know, even as I'm trying to capture some of the essence so that I can be able to clarify some of the, some, some of the evidence, you said that you are also working hand in glove with the Reserve Bank. Uh, well, National Treasury and the Reserve Bank obviously yes. um, cooperate on matters relating to uh, uh, managing fiscal and monetary policy coordination to reduce the overall vulnerability of South Africa's uh, economy and growth um, to financial market shocks uh, or, or other areas. And let me just check uh, whether she's audible to everybody. Uh, oh yeah, it looks like everyone can hear you. Okay, Good. thank you. Yes. <clears throat> now, may I refer you to exhibit P1? It's in a blue folder next to you. Uh, bef before that, uh, you started at National Treasury in 2010, you said, is that right? Mm -hmm. Before that, had you worked in um, any other government department or company where you were also dealing with something similar to what you are dealing with at, uh, at National Treasury? Um, I, I worked um, for... Um a, I worked for a private asset management company um, for four years where we focused on um, where I did economics and strategy, trying to understand what financial market implications would mean for investor portfolios. So we had pension funds and high net worth individuals who were advising how best to invest their money um, to protect their savings. And before that, I worked for a not-for-profit organization. Um, I worked for a specific area within it that um, um, managed developing country central bank's asset management uh, arm. So it helped them manage their bonds um, and did a lot of training with them to capacitate themselves to run that training, uh, to run the fund management for themselves. So, um how many years would you say you have been exposed to dealing with the type of issues that you are going to talk to us about today? 16 years. 16 years. Yes. Thank you very much. 
I have referred you to Exhibit P1. You'll see that that document runs from P1 A P one up until P1G. If you can turn over just the page to P1B, could you please identify that document for us? Um, yes, this is a note for the Zondo Commission on estimating the impact of Nenegate on um, government debt, which um, I compiled along with some colleagues from National Treasury. Yes. <laughs> now, before we even deal with the contents of that report, May I preface your evidence by requesting you to deal with two issues. The first one, if you can elaborate on the context of the report itself, and secondly, if you may deal with what were the immediate uh, impacts you know, of the Nenegate on the financial markets, if you can deal with them in turn, please. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I think um, the DG uh, already submitted in evidence about the impact of Nenegate on the economy as a whole. Um, but the question before us was, what was the specific impact on government debt and borrowing? So government borrowing costs are determined by the difference between expenditure and revenue, right? Um, in the report, uh, in paragraph 2.6, we note that the eventual outcomes are the result of making decisions on what should happen to revenue, borrowing, and um, expenditure. But for the purposes um, of this report, to help the Commission understand what is the impact of Nenegate on long-term debt, we've held revenue and expenditure constant, okay? And we've just looked at what were we planning to borrow um, uh, in the 2015 medium-term budget policy statement? So that was in October 2015, before NNA happened. And then it looks at what did we plan to borrow in 2016-17? And then after Nenegate happened, what were the costs on that borrowing? How much did that increase by? And that's the context for the report um, before us. Um, we're all aware that um, Nenegate was on, on, on the 9th of December 2015, and Immediately, we saw financial market impact. Um, when we woke up the next day, uh, on Friday, financial markets, um, on Thursday, rather, financial markets were all over the place. So we saw the rand. It was previously 14 rand 59 to the dollar on the 9th of December. That went to 15 rand 27 against the dollar on the 10th of December, reaching 15 rand 90 on the 11th of December against Mr. the dollar. Mr. While, while you are still dealing with the impact on the rent, there is a document that you have also prepared. That's Mr. Chair, I beg leave to hand in the document that would demonstrate the witnesses' evidence even much more clearer than what she's, you know, now doing without us understanding the, 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 the impact itself. I beg leave to hand in the document. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. We have marked it to be P1H in order to follow on the sequence of the last numbering of annexure P1. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure that when we look at this graph, it will illustrate better what you were conveying to the chairperson. Yes. Please Thank take you. us through the, through the am, am I correct that the blue line that one sees running uh, for, for, from top to the bottom, it indicate what we refer to as the Nenegate, a Nenegate event on, of the 9th, 12th, 2015? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, this chart here um, shows the rand against the dollar, so the number of rands that we must pay for every dollar. Uh, in this case, when the line goes up, it means the rand weakens because we have to pay more, dollar, uh, more rands for any given dollar. Um, what we saw um, from Nenegate, and which is 
perhaps not completely easy to appreciate on, on the scale of this graph, is that um, on the 11th of December, it reached 15 Rand 90, um, not the 10th of December. At the 10th of December, it reached 15 Rand 27. Obviously, there was trading happening during the day as well. I'm just quoting the close of business. Mm. Now, uh, when you see, um, we, we didn't just have the currency moving sharply, we also saw the price of bonds fell sharply. Um, so uh, that's also included uh, in the annex share um, and uh, annex share P1E yes, and um, P1F explain a little bit. It's possible to see some of the moves in um, financial markets. But if I could perhaps just say, you know, the, one of South Africa's most heavily traded bonds, the R186, the yield rose from 8.82% on the 9th of December to 9.87% on the 10th of December. That's a full percentage point higher. And again, with bonds, when the interest rate goes up, it means that when the yield goes up, it means the price has gone down. So this means uh, that investors view our bonds uh, as more risky. Um, on the 11th of December, so two days after, the yield on the R186 was 10.38%. Um, so even higher. Now, <clears throat> Minister Gadan has already given testimony to um, the Commission about the impact on equity markets, uh, which fell sharply. Um, and the banking sector has also uh, given testimony in response to um, the sharp, uh, the need to sell assets in order to cover the capital adequacy ratios. So these were all the immediate impacts um, because the market was surprised at Nenegate. Um, but as government, when we're trying to manage the impact of this on long-term debt, um, the short-term movement for a day or two or three can be managed to an extent because we would issue, we think about what it is that we issue into the market. So government holds a certain amount of cash that we keep for emergency situations and to manage if we're not able to go to the market on a particular day. But what matters for the overall cost on, on government debt is when these financial market movements are sustained. And that's really what we have tried to look at in this report, is focus on what were the sustained impacts of financial market movements, because that will give us what the ultimate impact is on government uh, debt. Now, if I may refer you to your report uh, on page P1B. Yes. You introduce your report by referring to the background. I am not going to bore you with paragraph 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.2, 2, 1 1.3. But of interest to me, it's paragraph 1.2, where you say that this act resulted in an increase in bond, bond yields and a depreciation of currency when markets open the next morning as investors repriced and risk associated with investing in South Africa, the change in ministers increased perception of the risk that South Africa, South, South African government commitments to fiscal sustainability was weakening. Yes. Can you simplify that to us and elaborate on what you're saying in paragraph 1.2? I think um, Mr. Fuzile gave uh, detailed statements yesterday and previously, as have others, about what the change in the ministers might mean. Um, the investors were also aware of what those um, perception, well, what a change in ministers might mean um, for the fiscus. As Mr. Fuzile pointed out yesterday, uh, National Treasury was um, attempting uh, to caution and to stop certain projects from coming through that were fiscally unsustainable. Um, and to the extent that a change in minister was seen as an erosion of um, National Treasury's attempts to stop unsustainable policies from being implemented, um, investors also saw that. Um, and they were concerned that the change in ministers would weaken um, uh, National Treasury's ability to fight those policies uh, within Cabinet. 
Now, you are also mentioning another economic fac factor here by saying that as investors repriced the risks associated with, the in with investing in South Africa. Yes. If you can also elucidate on that. Um, sure. Um, so whenever an investor buys a bond, um, they are assuming they'll get a certain amount of money back from the borrower every year in interest payments. And then when um, the loan comes due, then they'll expect to get a big lump sum at the end, okay? Um, investors are like banks when they look at you with a mortgage. They assess how likely is it that you're going to pay, lots of, pay me back every year and ultimately pay back that lump sum. Um, and similarly to banks, if you are borrowing from lots of different places, it raises a question about what is the affordability or your ability to pay back those loans. Um, so to the extent that a change in minister is, means that the government may borrow more, it changes investors' perceptions of how willing um, or how able the government will be um, to pay back debt, because if you're going to be borrowing lots, um, there's a question mark then about what the sustainability is. There's also a question mark, though, about whether or not, and this touches on um, DG Mohajane's um, initial inputs around the impact on, on growth, investors are also worried to the extent that uh, the change in minister signals um, a, a change in uh, perceptions around what we are going to do to raise growth, which also affects government's ability uh, to repay. Um, so all of these factors come into uh, their consideration um, and they're negative uh, in this instance. Yes. And in paragraph two of your report, you begin now to give details in relation to the quantifying the impact of the nether gate. And you do so in paragraph 2.1 and 2.2. Yes. Yes. I know that you might have superficially touched on some of the things, but do you wish to take us through the other components of the, the paragraphs? Um, I think if I could just... Well, be before you do that, let's just go back to what you uh, testified about a minute or so ago, the perceptions of the markets and the investors when there's a change of, of uh, ministers. Would I be correct to say that uh, uh, ordinarily, if the investors and the markets uh, know that the, the change of ministers is not the change of government, is not the change of the ruling party, is not the change of the president. The president is still the same president. The deputy president is still the same deputy president. Mm -hmm. The cabinet is still the same cabinet, except for one or two ministers who might have been dismissed. Uh, would I be right to say it's likely that if they trust that the president, the cabinet, the executive, the government, and the ruling party uh, its policies have not changed. Their implementation is not going to change just because there is a change of one or two ministers. Then their perceptions are likely to reveal any concern. But if they think that the government, maybe the ruling party, maybe the executive, the cabinet, the president, um, uh, might, uh, the, the, the absence of one or two ministers might make a change uh, of, of, in terms of implementation of policies, then they would be worried. Uh, I hope that I'm, <laughs> what I'm asking is, is clear enough, but yes. I'm just wondering uh, why ordinarily 
they should have that concern in circumstances where one is not talking about a new government coming in and they don't know maybe what it will mm. do. Um, I ask that knowing that sometimes perceptions have got nothing to do with right or wrong. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I think that um, ordinarily, as you point out, a change in finance minister shouldn't cause um, a big change if uh, the path of government uh, is well set and there's confidence in the ability of the minister. Um, so that's absolutely correct. I think um, what made Nenegate slightly different was that there were concerns about, um, about the manner in which uh, the minister was replaced and um, the individual who was replacing him as markets didn't know, uh, um, didn't, weren't familiar with him. Um, and it wasn't clear that um, there was a good reason for firing Minister Nene. Um, and equally, there were concerns that Minister Nene had been fired because of the timing of events mentioned by Mr. Fuzile yesterday. Um, so, um, I think also the thing to bear in mind is that financial markets price according to risks. Nothing is certain until it's happened. So um, what, uh, what, what you'll find is that certain events can stack up uh, and start to change perceptions and increase, uh, so we have this term tail risk, you know, if um, something has a small probability of going horribly wrong, um, but if that tail risk increases, even if it's only a five, 10% chance, um, financial asset prices will adjust to reflect that risk. Um, because if you are invested in a bond and you're hoping that that's going to look after a pension fund, you, um, you don't want the risk that, uh, although it may be a small probability that everything goes uh, wrong. Um, and so that's why you'll find that financial markets respond to perceptions rather than an actual event, uh, because they're pricing in this cumulative risk. Uh, it's almost thinking about what are the relative risks uh, associated uh, with investing in a given uh, asset. In, in your uh, consideration of the issues, um, I wonder whether you were able to look at um, other events in the past where maybe the markets had responded in a, a negative way to a change of ministers in the country. Um, I seem to have read something recently, probably just in the media, that um, when Mr. Trevor Manuel was appointed as Minister of Finance um, way back, I can't remember if it was 96 or 98, that there was some negative uh, reaction from the, the markets. Um, I, I have no idea. I suspect that it probably wasn't anything near what uh, uh, we saw when Minister Nene was dismissed. Um, I think I also read something to the effect, and I may be wrong in this regard, that when Minister Gordon was also appointed Minister of Finance, there was some uh, uneasiness in the markets. Uh, I'm, I'm almost sure that with regard to Mr. Gordon, it wasn't anything near. The, when Mr. Nene was dismissed. So I, I just wonder whether you have had a chance to look at that and compare and see how big the difference was in the reaction of the markets, or is that something you might not have had a chance to look at? Um, Chair, we haven't um, done that in this response. What we have tried to do, though, again, yeah. because 
it's not just necessarily about an individual, right? I think, um, as we point out in the documentation, Nenegate is a point, a very visible point uh, in the state capture project. Um, but it was reinforced by a series of events leading up to Nenegate and then also after it. And um, I think that it, it's not just about the minister's appointment, it's the context within which um, it The occurred. context in which the dismissal happened uh, caused the markets to react in the manner in which they reacted and with the intensity with which they did so. Exactly. Um, and then, Chair, what we've tried to do in the evidence is that we've, um, we've, we've tried to look at um, the longer-term impact on financial markets, as I mentioned, as a way of um, accepting that there were initial spikes in financial asset prices as a result of Nenegate. Um, but uh, if we took out that volatility and saw the differences in the levels, uh, that's how, what we've based the um, evidence on. So I think, you know, if you look at that P1H chart with the, with the RAND dollar exchange rate, um, financial asset prices are influenced by a range of factors, not just what's happening uh, domestically um, from a political perspective, but also what's happening internationally. Um, and so, um, and you can see from the chart that it spikes a lot. Um, and the point in time that you choose on the chart could have a very big impact on the estimate of what you're saying the effect of an gate would be. Because I could pick a very low number and compare it to a very high number. Um, yes. <laughs> and yes. then um, overstate the impact. So what we chose to do in the evidence was that we said what we would do is we would look at averages of what's happened to them. So we take away this um, short-term volatility in the daily prices, and what we've done is we've looked at what is the average of um, the RAND dollar exchange rate a month before Nenegate, and the average of the RAND dollar exchange rate a month after, and compared them. And then we did that for a bunch of different periods um, in order to sort of smooth um, the overall uh, financial market volatility. Well, you, it may be that this is something you, would, you are still going to deal with, but uh, let, let me say this and hear what your comments may be, because you have worked for a long time on uh, on these issues and uh, markets, investors, and their reaction to different situations in a country. Um, with, without passing any judgment on Mr. Nene's replacement at the time, but it does seem to me that logically, the reaction of the markets and, the, and the, the investors to the dismissal of Mr. Nene must, to a very large extent, have been influenced, among other things, by maybe, for lack of a better word, their lack of confidence in the replacement because I'm thinking that if Mr. Nene had been dismissed but had been replaced by, for example, Mr. Trevor Manuel, it's unlikely that uh, the markets would have reacted in the way they, they, they do. And I'm saying Mr. Trevor Manuel because he had been Minister of Finance for a long time. Mm -hmm. He was quite popular, as far as I understand, with the, the markets and so on. So if Mr. Nene had been dismissed but had been replaced by somebody that the markets had confidence in, uh, it's, um, I, I seem to think it's unlikely that they, they would have reacted in the way they did. Um, Chair, uh, that's likely, provided that the person, and, and this is not to say anything about Minister Manuel, um, but I think it's about the context in which um, Minister Nene was dismissed as well, um, because there were question marks about why he was dismissed, given uh, the pressure on the fiscus um, from various projects that were being uh, pushed from the 
than presidency. Um, so if there were, um, and now that you've put a name to it, then it's a bit harder to, to, to say one way or the other. Um, but um, if somebody else, not Minister von Royen, was, was put in that um, position, um, if that individual were um, associated with the state capture project in any way, then I, I think even if they were seen to be a, a, a good investor, I think there would be question marks raised about it. Yeah, no, obviously the choice of the name that I've put in uh, uh, as a reason because, uh, um, and the issue of the context is important. Uh, what I'm thinking is that they, the, the market might have uh, would have had a certain perceptions about how Mr. Nene was doing his job. And um, it seems they were quite happy. Mm. And, um, and uh, maybe the question of who he was replaced by made them think that it was somebody who was unlikely to continue to do what they believed was the right thing. True. And if the replacement was somebody that they believed would do the right thing, then they are unlikely to have, they would have been unlikely to react in the way that they, they did. Um, yes, that's, that's possible. Um, I think what is important to note as well, though, is that after um, Nenegate, Minister Gordan was uh, reappointed as finance minister. And because of the continued pressure that Minister Gordan remained under, uh, which investors saw, um, there was still pressure on financial asset prices. So you can see again there with the Rand dollar exchange rate, there was, there was still uh, pressure um, because the state capture project, it had a very um, visible impact with Nenegate, um, but it was a risk that was building um, over time as the events that were described yesterday, for example. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. McGuinness. Ms. Metroid, am I correct that in, as part of your evidence, you have also provided the commission with some graphs and figures? Yes. which we'll be dealing with in due course, where you are also referring to specific events that might have an impact on the economics of the country. Um, yes. Yes. We will deal with them in due course in order to properly contextualize your evidence in relation to the Nenegate. For now, may I refer you back to page P1B? Yes and where you begin to quantify the impact of the Nenegate, you do so in paragraph 2.1 and 2.2. Could you please elaborate on those paragraphs? Sure. Um, so I think we've covered 2.1 in our discussions. Yes. Um, relating to 2.2, this is what we've um, tried to estimate. Um, so, uh, Economists always have two hands, and they say on the one hand this, and on the other hand that, and in a sense that's what we've presented for you here. Yes. We've um, given a range of potential impacts on bond yields um, of between 0.5... Well, I can, I can tell you lawyers also like on the one <laughs> hand and on the other. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, yes. um, so what we have said is that uh, we've, we've estimated that the RAND was about 10% weaker against the US dollar. And then we've presented a range of estimates for how uh, much weaker bond yields were. So we've got 0.5 percentage higher or one percentage point higher from the typical borrowing rate. Um, so Chair, to explain how we got to these two numbers, um, if I could refer you to P1D, um, which is a table in the annex show, which just talks to um, f changes in financial market prices. Are you referring to table one? Table one. Yes. Um, and this is what we were talking, what I was talking about earlier, about looking at averages rather than a point in time. And, and what this table basically does is it says, okay, if we go to um, 
if you look at the second column, we've got the generic two-year bond yield for the South African government. And what we did was we took the average yield for a month before Nenegate and the average yield for a month after Nenegate, and we looked at what is the difference in that cost. And what became, it was about a percentage point, 1.03 percentage points different, okay? Mm. If we, if we average two months before and after, it was 1.19 percentage points different, um, and so on. So that's the way that the table has been constructed. And you can see in that second column, that's the two-year bond yield. So that's when government would pay back the money in two years, and then the 10-year bond yield uh, longer term. The third column there is the um, South African sovereign spread um, that's produced by JP Morgan. Now, what a spread is, is that it says, how much riskier would it be uh, to, well, how much more expensive is it for um, the South African government to borrow compared to the US government? And this difference in, the, in, in those um, yields is, what um, uh, what the spread is, okay? And that gives an indication of how risky investors perceive being in South Africa. So when the spread rises, people think that it's more risky investing in South Africa, and when it falls, they think it's becoming less risky relative to the US. Um, <clears throat> So we've looked at that difference between us and, and the US, again, using the same methodology. And you can see that what's happened is that spread has basically increased by between either 0.8 percentage points or 1.10 percentage points. And, and you're doing that with reference to a period before the Nenegade, yes. and the period after the Nenegade, so that we can appreciate the risk factors as perceived by the international, market, international markets. That's correct. Um, and then you can see next to that, we have the emerging market spread. Now, why would I bother to put emerging markets if we're focusing on South Africa? Um, obviously, our bond prices are affected not just by uh, what's happening domestically, but also what's happening globally. Um, and South Africa is seen as a key emerging market. So. Um, when things go horribly wrong in Brazil and Turkey, sometimes it has an impact on our financial market prices. Um, so we wanted to be sure that what we were picking up wasn't just global trends uh, in South African prices. Um, and so what you can see there is that there was an increase in um, emerging markets um, spreads um, over the same periods of Nene Gate, um, much less than the South African spreads, though. Okay, and <clears throat> in essence, these are the these are the basis of having this range. So, if you were to subtract the emerging market spread from the South African spread, you can see that it's about 50 basis points, okay, um, 0.5 percentage points. Sorry. Um, and so that's informed the lower end of the estimate. And then we've also shown that because all of our bonds have basically increased by a full percentage point over the different time periods compared, that's why we've got the one percentage point increase in the cost of, of yields. On the final right-hand column, we've got the changes of the RAND dollar exchange rate. Okay, so a depreciation in the RAND means that the RAND is less valuable. It takes more RANDs to buy one dollar. And here, contrary to the bonds where you see a stabilization, the RAND, uh, the RAND depreciated quite dramatically. If I can refer you again to P1H, the picture of the RAND versus the um, dollar, the RAND does... It, it's, it's, it's a separate document, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you. The RAND weakens quite substantially through until January 2016, and then regains, and then you see the line coming down means that the RAND is strengthening again uh, from a point of weakness. Um, but I think the important thing to note with the RAND is that it is still much weaker than it was. So a year after Nenegate, the RAND was a lot weaker than a year before Nenegate. Because Nenegate, yes, we've used it as a point in time, but you can also see the RAND depreciation starting to pick up um, before Nenegate because people were worried about the state capture project before Nenegate itself hit. It was just a, 
it was a, it was a point in time. Um, and so this is why we've come up with a rand dollar depreciation rate of 10% um, for our estimate in terms of what we think has, has impacted on long-term government debt. Yes. You also provide two scenarios in order to, in, in order to illustrate the, the impact of the Nene Gate, and you do so in paragraph 2.3 and 2.4. Can you please explain to us those two scenarios? So those two scenarios are the 0.5 percentage point and a 10 percent RAND depreciation and the one percentage point increase in government borrowing costs plus a 10 percent depreciation. Um, I, I, think in, I think those are reasonably conservative uh, estimates um, in terms of the overall impact on, on the NA gate. Um, <clears throat> We, um, so we present those um, results uh, now. I don't know if you'd like me to go through yes. the figures or if we want to go through. So in terms of the results, um, for the first scenario, um, we have the stock of debt rising by 26 billion rand um, compared to what we had projected in the 2015 MTBPS. Um, and then what we find is that um, our overall um, debt service costs would be three billion rand higher. Um, in 2016-17 relative to projections um, in the MTBPS of 2015. And then under scenario two, we have that the stock of debt would rise by 33 billion rand in 2016-17. Um, it well, it would be higher. And then debt service costs would be about 5 billion rand higher as well. That is posed to the Nenegate. That is post Nenegate, yes. So what we've done is we've taken what national, we've taken um, what we had originally projected uh, in the 2015 MTBPS and seen what would that um, 0.5 percentage points higher in overall borrowing costs mean for the government or and, and a 10% weaker rand. If I could um, maybe just point out that, you know, this is based on a model, a funding model from National Treasury that we use to consider the impact of various risk factors on our bond issuance strategy. So we, before every MTBPS and budget, we plan where are we going to be able to issue government debt in the most cost-effective way for taxpayers, um, taking into account financial market movements. Um, and so our funding model basically helps us think about different fiscal planning scenarios because although we present uh, in budget, we present a central case, and then we also present different scenarios, we have to figure out how would our borrowing strategy change and um, where are the pressure points. So um, that's the model we've used here. Um, we use that model to communicate with ratings agencies and the IMF, um, and actually we've started to publish results from that model, for example, in the 2018 MTBPS. Um, so just so that you know, there's some context um, to where we've come up uh, with, this, with, this, uh, with these numbers here. And so we've used that model given the assumptions that we've, I've detailed to you on interest rates and currency moves. And how, how does this impact, you know, on the budget of the country when you have the rent taking a dive, as you have already illustrated, and taking how the, the, st the stock debt would rise to those figures that you have already mentioned to the chair? How does that impact the budget yeah. itself? So I think, you know, the thing with government is that when you are borrowing, you are having to lock in uh, those rates, right? Mm. So the problem is, is that we, we then, we have increased the stock of debt, say, by 33 billion rand, okay? But that stock of, that increase remains in your government debt stock until such point in time that you can pay down that debt, which basically means that you are bringing in more revenue than you're spending. Um, as you're all aware, we, we have not run a budget surplus since the time of uh, Nene Gate. Um, our revenues have underperformed um, and it's um, put pressure on our borrowing. So any increase in that government debt stock uh, 
remains. So I think it's important to bear in mind that, especially for um, an issuer, um, when we increase uh, risk perceptions of South Africa, it has real effects on the fiscus, which also means that it's money that we're not spending on, um, <clears throat> it's money that we're not spending on overall social uh, priorities. Uh, instead, we wind up spending more on debt service costs. Yes, and in paragraph 2.7, you further illustrate the point, and it appears to be actually talking to the issues that we, you, you, you did highlight shortly, uh, uh, earlier on in your evidence, but in far much more details and figures. Yes, um, so in paragraph 2.7, um, I outline what actually we, we presented in the Budget Review 2016 um, for 2016-17 outcomes uh, relative to what we had expected um, at the October MTBPS. Um, and there you'll see that our actual debt service costs uh, rose by 5 billion. They were higher by 5 billion between February 2016 and um, the MTBPS 2015, um, which means that debt service costs in 2016-17 were 11.4% of our total spend. Um, in the MTBPS 2015, they were meant to be 10.9%. Now, the reason why we don't ascribe this simple difference between Budget Review 2016 and MTBPS 2015 to Nenegate alone is because they were, in terms of borrowing costs, is because there were lots of other decisions that had to be made about what are we going to do with revenue, what are we going to do with expenditure and total borrowing. So that five billion is the outcome of a number of decisions around, um, well, not just the five billion, but also the overall budget balance <coughs> decision um, were a number of decisions. We chose to raise revenues um, and so on to try and reduce the budget deficit faster so that investors would um, to, to try and encourage confidence in overall fiscal rectitude. Yes. On, may I refer you to page P1E? Sure. You are dealing there with different figures and graphs in order to illustrate the point that you're making to the chair about the impact of the gate. Yes. Mr. Chair, we have prepared the color, the color pages of the, of the same document in order for you to be able to follow the evidence of the witness. We beg leave to hand them in. Thank you. We are not going to refer them to any different number. It's, it, it's the same document that you're having. Yeah. They are just in color. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if, if, if you can take figure one in relation to the currency movements and how the rent remained weak following the Nenegade. Okay, sure. So um, what we've done on figure one <coughs> is different to what you looked at on P1H. This isn't the rand dollar exchange rate um, written as 15 rand to the dollar, for example. What we've done is we've taken the average 2014 level of the rand um, and calculated that as 100, and then you can see how the rand has moved um, relative to that. Um, and then what we've done here is we've done the same thing for an index of emerging market currencies. That's just to make again this point that what happened to emerging markets, you can see that they, although they weakened, um, they weakened slightly in um, uh, 2016 relative to their 2015 levels, it was nowhere near what happened to the RAND. Yes, but now help us to understand, be careful that you're talking to lawyers here, you have a red line and the greenish line that are on the bottom, what, what, what do they represent? Sorry, the red line is the Rand dollar exchange rate yes. that are represented as an index, and the gray line is the emerging market currency index, also represented as an index. Yes, and the blue line that cut across, that would be no, no, the Nenegate gate event, and you've done that by taking the position before and the, uh, the, the position after the Nenegate event. 
Yeah, I, I think here we, um, this is just to illustrate the difference between um, the, exactly, it's a year before and a year after on either side of that blue line. Now, the figure two. Yes. What does it uh, illustrate in relation to the bonds? Sure. These are um, generic bond yields. So the government issues specific types of bonds, but these are generic, so, um, so that you can always compare what is a two-year look like and a 10-year. The red line is the 10-year, and the gray line is the two-year bond yield. Um, a year before up to a year after Nenegate, which is represented by the blue line. And it should be clear to everybody that there's a shift change upwards in, although um, the prices recover from the initial spike, they remain well above what they were um, prior to Nenegate. So the Nenegate effects were felt even beyond the, the one year period that you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes. I, I, um, sorry. You can go to P1F. You have the figure three. Okay. So if you can please explain it to us. Sure. So bear with me on figure three. I know it's got five lines, so and this is violating the rule of how many, how many lines you're supposed to put on any chart. Um, but what it is, um, is it's the yield curve. So you'll see along the x-axis it says maturity, and then, so it'll plot what is the yield for a given, um, for a given maturity of bond, okay? And the shape of that is the yield curve. And what we've done here is we've shown that a month, two, two months before Nenegate, which is the light gray line underneath, you can see that for borrowing across all different types of government bond instruments, um, the, the yields were much lower um, than for the very dark black line, which is Nenegate itself. Um, you can see that one month after Nenegate, which is the red dotted line, um, yields were very, very high. They were, um, they were almost a full um, percentage point or more higher, um, percentage and a half point higher than um, Nenegate. Um, and then they came down somewhat two months after Nenegate. Um, but we're still well above Nenegate and well above um, the times before. And figure number four? Um, figure number four um, just puts the, um, the yield for the R186, which is a specific government bond, not a generic bond. Um, that matures on the 21st of December 2026. And you can just see what's... Um, the point here is really that um, there are multiple th shocks that affect financial asset prices and um, political developments affect bond yields. And as you've mentioned, some can be positive as well as uh, negative uh, for financial asset prices. It depends on what the context is. Um, but concentrating on the Nenegate, what was the picture in relation to figure number four? Um, it, this simply illustrates um, all, of the, all, all of the changes that we've seen, but you can see as well that after Minister Gordon was, um, was announced as finance minister, yields did come back down, which speaks to the chair's point about um, credibility. Um, but they remain still above what they were before. Now, you come to certain conclusions in your report, and I have deliberately not dealt with them uh, initially because I wanted to give the benefit of explaining this, evi this evidence within the context of the graphs that you've actually also referred to. May I refer you to an extra P1C mm -hmm. and take us through your conclusions on paragraph three. Sure. Um, so, as I've mentioned in, in the conclusions, um, political uncertainty has real costs. Um, it can be difficult to isolate the exact impact of a given event, um, but in terms of what we've seen before us, Nenegate was um, uh, a very visible uh, point in the overall state capture project, um, but uh, its impact was long-lasting because 
um, of subsequent events as well. Um, we have just here given the, the impact of Nenegate on government borrowing costs. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that the ultimate incidence of these borrowing costs will depend on the spending and taxation choices of government. But ultimately, South African citizens and taxpayers are worse off um, as a result of um, these financial market movements, and ultimately they're caused by political, they've been caused by political uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> I think what we see is that it, Econometric evidence generally suggests that um, the cumulative impact of many events that raise political and economic uncertainty raise the costs of borrowing, they reduce investment, they reduce growth, and this together hampers our efforts to raise employment and fight inequality in the country. Yes. Now, having regard to your evidence, you also refers to your report to the work of uh, Shachuayo and Yes. And in their book, if I'm correct, they say that the, that, the, that policy and uncertainty is unique in that it can be proactively managed, if not altogether avoided. Do you agree with that statement? And can you share with us in what manner could that be avoided? Um, I think policy uncertainty can be um, proactively managed. Um, I think that uh, efforts to engage with investors, to maintain fiscal transparency, um, to create the social compact, which um, the President Ramaphosa has been um, seeking to do, um, and to take demonstrable actions um, to resolve uh, outstanding policy issues or all manners in which uh, policy uncertainty can be actively managed. Um, how, can, how can it be avoided? Um, so, so here, uh, I think it can be, I think by actively managing that, it does reduce policy uncertainty. Can it be avoided in an absolute sense? Let's take the let's I, take I let's take your evidence in relation to the Nenegate. No, no, absolutely. I, yes. I think that it I think that um, it it can be managed. Um, I don't believe nothing is ever a hundred percent certain. Um, but I think that the levels of uncertainty um, that we faced here, there was definitely room to reduce those dramatically, um, and that could have and and I believe that a large part of the political uncertainty um, that generated these financial market movements yes. could have been avoided. And I'm posing this question having in mind the recommendations that might be made at the end of this commission. If you can assist us, I mean, what are the known consequences of policy uncertainty? Um, look, I mean, as I've already highlighted what I think the, the, the policy uncertainty um, it has real costs, um, but there will there will always be a, some element of uncertainty in what we do, um, because we have um, we have changing priorities as a country. We may have changing uh, changing leadership, so I don't think that it's possible to say that you want no policy that that it's that it's an achievable goal to have absolute complete policy certainty in every sphere. Um, but that said, I think that there, um, that by acting decisively, it's possible to really minimize the impact that policy uncertainty um, has. So, for example, um, National Treasury has made a number of recommendations that we should um, we should follow through on policies that we say we're going to uh, make, and uh, we need to have those policies need to be designed uh, after consultation with all relevant parties, and they need to take into account the overall policy uh, environment. You need to have transparency about the, fiscal, uh, the policy making process, um, and it's important as well to underline um, 
the certainty around the macroeconomic policy framework as well. Yes. We, we have heard your evidence and we appreciate you know, its context in relation to the illustrations that you've made. What would you say, I mean, having regard to your evidence in totality, to a comment that you know, if a rent was to fall, it can simply be picked up? <laughs> the sanitized version of what I would say to that, um, is that um, it's easy to be glib about these sort of things, but there, financial market asset prices, asset prices may recover eventually. But the thing is, is that between the point at which they've fallen and when they finally recover, government has to go out to the market and convince people to borrow, uh, to lend us money, okay? And during that period of time, we have to pay more in order to convince them to lend money to us so that we can continue to fund our social spending programs. Between the time when the asset price is low and when you manage to pick it up uh, at some point, you have pensioners who are retiring and cashing in their pension funds. And those pension funds will be of a low value. Between the time that it falls and you pick it up again, you have banks having to meet their capital adequacy ratios, which means that they're having to sell other investments in order to meet those um, adequacy requirements. By them selling those other assets, it puts those assets under pressure as well. So I would say that I would say that that's uh, the statement of somebody who neither appreciates the impact of financial asset prices on ordinary citizens and certainly not on government borrowing. Mr. Chair, that concludes the questions for this witness. No, that, that's uh, uh, fine. Uh, Ms. McLeod, thank you very much for coming to assist us with regard to these issues that had been raised with the DG before. Um, it, may, it may or may not be that is the last time you are here. If you, there is a need, we'll ask you back to clarify some of the things, but so far, I think that I can release you. Thank you. Um, something that has got not, nothing to do with the substance of your evidence uh, in, uh, at uh, P1F. Um, the bottom column there, uh, you and your team overlooked the fact that you, on the right-hand side, with regard to the 9th of October, you referred to Mr. Nene as simply Ntlantla. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it, it's, it's not appropriate. Um, um, I, it's and certainly not in a forum such as this. So would I ask you to arrange for an amended document, if possible, to replace that page? And uh, the replacement can be made in 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 in, uh, in every uh, a copy of the same document or bundle. Uh, just check if you haven't been to sketch us to somebody else in the same way throughout the document. I just picked up this one. Um, thank you, Chair. It's actually just that the the boxes um, have have shortened in the in the thing, so it actually says. Uh, and then also the, the you'll see on the bottom one it, it says returns as and then it's Minister of Finance which is also being cut off uh, but we'll um, adjust those so thank you for the spot uh, well uh, are you saying Nene appears somewhere other than where one expects it to appear it's just the box um, the box uh, cut off the last two lines of text. Mm, mm. So, but thank you for the spot, you, and you we'll will, adjust yeah, it. Thank yeah. you. It's Mr. Ntlantlanene. Yes. 
Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you are excused. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm told that it's technology. Nene was there, but it just caught, it got cut off when they were trying to do the the structures. Yeah, well, uh, I think that's uh, that's what she was. She we'll, was we'll pick, we'll, we'll pick up the same name Nene somewhere. We'll make sure that it's there. <laughs> Just uh, make sure that uh, nothing appears to not uh, give people proper respect. Okay, thank you. You're excused. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes. That, that's the only uh, the, the, witness the we had for today. today. Yes, and tomorrow the ESCOM team will be proceeding with the leading of the evidence of um, matters related to ESCOM. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, we are going to adjourn for to, today, and um, we are going to resume tomorrow. Before we adjourn, uh, there is a need that uh, this week um, I use the time from three o'clock upwards for another meeting, a meeting of the commission and the legal team and the investigators. Um, now, in order for us not to lose, uh, not from three o'clock, I think from two o'clock, not to lose those two hours, we may have to start early one of the days, or more than one day, and or finish one hour or so later than four, just to make sure that by end of the, by the end of the week we haven't lost any time in terms of the time that we must use for hearings. So, but uh, tomorrow I think we could start at normal time and then we can look at whether we, we should finish, we should continue beyond four up to five or whether we do that uh, on Thursday and Friday only. So, but we can finalize tomorrow. So we adjourn now until tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We adjourn.